Uh, I want to welcome everyone who uh, reached out to uh, our event because uh, we we're still not in life, so uh, we can. Hello, everyone. Hi, Bushra. Hi, Bushra. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Uh, we are in life now. Hello, uh, make sure that uh, my screen is shared already. Yeah. Yes, it's shared. So, uh, ha hello and uh, and welcome to everyone who's joining us in the first edition of Women in Data Science uh, at the University of Mohammed VI Polytechnic uh, uh, UN6P. Uh, I'm so happy to uh, to welcome everyone, all the attendees who is uh, who are interested with the, the the field of data science, and uh, I uh, want to welcome uh, all the the speakers, the amazing women speakers that we uh, we have today. Uh, so. Uh, before we start, I want to present my, uh, myself quickly. So I am Bushra Shemem, and I am in my first year PhD candidate in machine learning uh, at the MSDR Labs, Modeling Simulation and Data Analysis at the uh, Mohammed VI Polytechnic University. And I am the WID ambassador with the uh, with uh, with uh, Hasna and Safa, Sana and uh, Fatima Sahra. Uh, before we start, I just want to thank uh, all uh, uh, the persons that help us uh, from the university, Mohammed VI Polytechnic, uh, and uh, our uh, labs, MSD labs, who support us in all the steps that we uh, we follow uh, to reach out uh, our event today and uh, for uh, tomorrow. So to, just to make sure that uh, our event will be uh, to, uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, start at uh, from 2 p.m. till 5 p.m. And uh, let me introduce now our uh, organization team and the ambassador of uh, women in data science for the first edition uh, in our university. So uh, Ambusha Shemem, uh, Hasna Zerwawi, uh, Safa El Misawi, uh, Sana El Misawi, and Fatima Zahra El Hamram. Uh, and I want to thank them so much for collaborating with us and we work so hard to reach out to the event. Uh, now we will uh, welcome the opening uh, with the Stanford uh, community video to know more and to let you know more about uh, what is with about uh, what is with. And uh, just before start the video, I want to, to say that uh, uh, the women, uh, the WIDS uh, conference has started as a technical uh, conference in the Stanford, Uni Stanford University, and now is he is about uh, a global movement in all over the world about uh, 150 uh, regional uh, ambassadors and about uh, in uh, in about 60 uh, countries. And I will let uh, now uh, Fatima Zahra to uh, share the video about, uh, about uh, the women in data science community. Fatima Zahra, okay. Uh, don't I want to accept? Oui. 
Ahí, Fátima Zahra, ¿tú vas a No, pas encore. No. Yes, ahí. ¿Tú puedes compartir la video? No. No, se va, sí. Sorry for the technical issue. C'est bon? Uh, you can start it. Yes. Okay. We don't hear uh, anything. We still don't hear anything, uh, Fatima Zahra. We are sorry for the, the late and technical issues. So we'll just uh, wait to start. No? Yes. Yes. Bon? Data science yes. has never been so important as it is now, and it keeps on gaining importance all around the world, providing loads of opportunities and, and really helping change the way we do business, the way we take care of ourselves and, and of the planet. It is so important to have women in artificial intelligence in the area of data science and also in leadership roles. It's being able to use data to solve issues and understand bigger problems, it's critical. If that is going to become completely data driven over time, then you can't miss that opportunity. You've got to join in and, 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 and have your say. Because data science is becoming more and more important, uh, really imperative that people that work on problems related to data science, that report out and make data-driven decisions uh, are a true representation of the world, regardless of gender, regardless of where you're from. AI, machine learning, data science, they all have this amazing, incredible potential for impact. But imagine the potential if we added more diversity. The future is diverse. Our world is becoming increasingly complex, more interconnected. To be fully engaged citizens in the 21st century, we need to embrace diversity in all aspects of life. We're thrilled to host this year's 24-hour virtual around the world conference that we called WITS Worldwide, particularly in this really challenging year where we all crave community and connection. This year, we're celebrating International Women's Day by celebrating these amazing female role models in the field of data science, machine learning, and AI. We are going global on a whole new and much bigger scale. And the global perspective is really at the core of everything we're doing now. And I'm excited to share that the conference today features over 40 plenary speakers from over 25 countries. That's across all continents, except for Antarctica. So we're still looking for a great speaker for next year there. Hosting a virtual event has provided an opportunity for our WIDS ambassadors to enjoy even more community and more collaboration, which I know we all need during this pandemic. The WIDS Datathon has also grown up around this concept of building a global community. In fact, this year's Datathon is our largest yet we have participation from over 3,600 people from over 85 countries. 
and they're all working together, um, some across borders, uh, on a healthcare data set focus on intensive care units in hospitals. I'm particularly thrilled to announce a new initiative in WITS, the WITS Workshops an educational program where people from all levels and all backgrounds can learn more about data science from outstanding women around the world. We're kickstarting WITS workshops at this conference with 14 brand new workshops that we'll be posting online after the conference as well. And this is just the start. From now on out, every month we'll add new workshops to uh, this program. Join us for WITS workshops. As a professor, I'm always thinking about how to broaden participation in statistics and data science. What are gateways to the field outside of calculus? What are other ways to enter our profession? I love speaking to a room full of talented women. There's just something about it. We are so happy that you can join us here and at the WITS regional events. Enjoy. Thank you, Fatima Zahra, for sharing this video. Uh, now I will welcome uh, and I, I so uh, I thank Ikram, Ikram Shai, Professor Ikram Shairi, which is my supervisor, and uh, Professor uh, uh, Selma Al Habibi that uh, are uh, accepted to be with us uh, in today's uh, events. So I will pass the, the talk to uh, to Ikram to for the opening message. Thank you, Bushra. Uh, thank you, everyone. I, I really um, appreciate all the efforts that uh, you organizing committee have done and uh, with ambassadors have done in this uh, event. So I would like to start by thanking you uh, for your engagement and um, your effort to organize those uh, two days of weeds. Um, and uh, I'm really happy uh, to, uh, to, to, to host and to have this event uh, by our research group, which is MSDA, Modeling Simulation and Data Analysis. As um, in our group, we really, uh, we really, um, we are really aware about the, the importance of data science in the future and how the data-driven decisions will be impacting the, um, the, the different area of our lives. Um, and also we really believe about uh, the, the gender diversity in a group, how it's uh, really important to increase the collective intelligence of, of the groups. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to be part of uh, this initiative. And I would like um, also to emphasize about this thematic of uh, this two days of workshop, which is academy and, um, and uh, industry, uh, which is um, a part of the vision of our research group and the part of the vision of all uh, UM6P uh, uh, University, as we all believe that uh, the, the, the bridge between industry and academy is uh, true uh, applied uh, research. Uh, I, I would like also to thank our speakers. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to have you all and uh, I thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, so if you allow me, I would like to uh, present uh, the speakers of today, uh, which will start with the uh, professor, uh, which will start with uh, Dr. Ikram Shraibi uh, from uh, MIT Atlantic. And uh, she will talk about expla explainable uh, artificial intelligence. And then we, uh, we will see uh, Nirmeen uh, Al-Hamedi uh, from uh, Microsoft uh, UAA uh, that uh, she, she will speak about the power of artificial intelligence. And then Professor uh, Karima Shihabi, uh, 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 sorry, um, uh, from, uh, sorry, it was a um, mistake maybe, um, uh, from uh, OCP uh, policy. Uh, uh, Professor Karima, sorry, Professor Karima Shihabi from uh, from UM6P that will 
talk about uh, scalable data science and uh, data, the uh, big data uh, series. And uh, finally, we will have a talk from Professor Najis Hilal from International University in Geneva. Uh, and she will uh, speak about the gender gap in uh, STEAM. Um, and we have also Ikram, if uh, you are forget Mariam. The, the yeah, so, sorry, yeah, sorry. It's um, Dr. Mariam uh, uh, El Khishafi from o OCP Policy that uh, will talk about artificial intelligence from theory to, to practice. Um, thank you, Bushra. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, for being here. And uh, I hope uh, it will be a, um, a productive uh, afternoon. And we will talk about data science, uh, women, and uh, different uh, thematics related to uh, this event. I give you the, the floor, Bushra. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ikram, for this uh, amazing talk. So, uh, before the just we start, I just welcome uh, uh, Selma, uh, Professor Selma Lahbabi to just for uh, uh, 30 seconds or one minute to, to say something. Hi, Professor Selma Lahbabi. Oh, hello, uh, Bushra. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm very happy to, uh, to be part of this event and uh, looking forward to all the talks and all the discussions. Uh, yeah, let's, let's start. I will give you uh, Ikram now to, to present your presentation. Thanks, Bushra, but I do not have, I don't have the right to share my screen for the moment yet. No, you can, you can now. Perfect, thank you, that's very really great. Up, let me share you my screen, perfect. Is it working for everybody? Super. So, hello everyone, my name is Ikram and um, I'm really happy to be here with the community of women in data science this year. Thanks for having me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity also to, to give this talk about um, explainable artificial intelligence and how to make humans and machines collaborate together. So up, let me change the screen. So I'm Ikram. I currently work as a postdoctoral researcher in the field of explainable AI, also known as XAI. I work at the crossroad of AI and cognitive science, and I'm strongly interested in the impact of human on AI, but also inversely at the cognitive level, the social level, and the algorithmic level, sorry. So the name of the, my research team is DECIDE. We work in the field of um, the decision support system design in the context of heterogeneous and complex data. And we aim to put the human being at the center of the design of the system. DECIDE uh, is a team of, uh, that is related to the LabStick Laboratory, which is both part first of the CNRS, which is the French National Center for Scientific Research. And also uh, we work with the IMT Atlantic. We belong to the IMT Atlantic Engineering School in France, in Brest. So today I have the opportunity to tell you a little story about explainable AA and what it is. So first, before to start talking about AI, let me give you some context. Well, in the data science field and more globally in AI, we heard and talked a lot about deep learning this last year. AI has taken a lot of place in our existence. We know it. We even heard about it in TV news. So it's no longer just a technical or research topic. But it's now also a public issue, a public matter. And this is important. So why? We know that recently from almost 2010, the explosion of the volume of data available combined with the computational power of CPU and GPUs that we have, have allowed us to have the implementation and to use deep learning algorithms in different domains that provide us very good performance. But the problem is that the increase of this computational power also leads to a loss of interpretability of the model used. And this is especially true for the deep learning models. And this 
this is what leads us to what we call today the black box problem. In other words, we know how to implement the models. We know how, what is the data, what is the data provided, learn, and we know how to test them. But we have no certainty about the reason behind the prediction. If we say it in other words, we don't have the, um, the reason, any idea or certainty about the reasoning process of the models. And this leads to what exactly? What is the impact of this kind of element? It is that the adoption of rapid AI in some countries to deal with various social and business issue has brought out a lot, has brought out a lot of surprise. It was discovered, we discovered recently that a machine that is supposed to be completely objective could be discriminating. And this is because, because, of, because of what we call biases. Indeed, many studies show that the um, cognitive and the cultural biases that are from that comes from human and society that we live in can through the data can impact the behavior of AI model and this will lead to potential discrimination and the trust of acceptability and the trust um, between humans and machines. Here are, for example. Uh, some discrimination situation that were related um, put a light to the press. For example, there was shown it was shown that Twitter can will always put a white face uh, above um, someone with another color of face, skin color. Sorry. It was shown also that some computer vision algorithm uh, can have a classification. Um, results that can discriminate the category of population among others, like we can see in this example here. And it can also, it was also shown that there was some issue with the um, facial recognition algorithm that discriminate against people of color. And of course, there are also some examples of unfortunately discrimination by race and gender. So this, all these elements have led to Ah, sorry, <laughs> I was too quick. <laughs> have led to the um, to a questioning, a questioning that about the black box issue, about how can we behave and be better teacher for our models, and this is questions that are not only in the technical and scientific field, but there are also global general public that start wondering about the impact of AI in their life, and that's really important. So. Let's note also that there are many legislation about the fact that it is no longer ever possible to use algorithms without knowing exactly how they behave and what is, um, what is their um, inner mechanism. The main idea is that we, it is today only possible to use transparent algorithms that have contributed to put in light the field more ever. Since today there are many restrictions and sanctions in, the, in, the, in this field, the, we cannot, for example, the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation uh, law that was adopted in Europe, in Montreal, the Declaration de Montreal for Responsible AA, and at the United States level, we can also note the program of the DARPA, which is all or dedicated to artificial, to explainable artificial intelligence. At the scientific level, this uh, leads concretely to an increase to the work in the field, as we can observe here. And especially around 2016 and 2018, the respective year of the DARPA program and the, and the GDPR. So here is a small view about the global context that we are currently working it for the explainable AI field. So as a consequence of all the story, the domain of explainability has been brought to light. And this domain is kind of the promise, the promise to, to, to have a better understanding of the machine by the human and since the human should be able to better understand the reasoning process. So let's see some definition. First, let me tell you that the explainable AI is a field at the crossroad of different fields. Of course, computer science first, but there is also work in cognitive science, ethics, philosophy, psychology, and so many other fields that will impact this field and impact our work. If we have to define what is explainability, we will say that Given an audience and the context, explainability consists of providing an explanation that explains the behavior of a model. In other words, the main idea is that if you have an algorithm that make a classification, for example, it's, we should be able to understand why it did it. 
And it's in, in this example, we have the picture here that is put in light, um, a part of the picture is put in light in order to explain that this is the part that make the algorithm say that there is a girl in the, in the picture, original picture. And also there is a teddy bear here. And um, that explain why there is a teddy bear prediction. We can see here that an explanation can be multimodal. The main purpose of expa if, um, explainable IA is to provide an, an explanation. And what is an explanation? It is supposed to be an information in a semantically complete, self-sufficient and user accessible format. The shape can be multimodal. The main important thing is that you can use all the means that you want in order to provide an intelligible information. The challenge of um, explainable IA is that it should be able to address anyone, decision maker, technical user, or not, child, adult, people with different cognitive profile. And this is a big challenge because it means that we should understand the expectation of those people when they deal with machine learning or deep learning. It should also be able to adapt to context, emergency, issue, real time. So there is an adaptive explainable IA also a question that we should ask. And finally, just to reassure everyone, this question of knowledge extraction, how the, how the model behaves, is not a new one. The scientific community has been wondering about this for quite, quite a few years now. And there are many great conferences in the field that already target um, the, the question about knowledge uh, inside the AA model. For we say briefly earlier that IA should, explainable IA should be accessible for everyone. It is true. We can think first of the users that will be affected with the, of the IA model. We can also think of the business experts on the domain that use this model, for example, health, industry, or insurance. The target of the audience of explainable IA can also be um, agencies, low agency government that should legif legiferate about this topic. But also in companies, sometimes there are leader, manager, decision maker that doesn't have a technical profile, but need also to, to, to make a decision based on the, on the prediction of a model. So they also need explainable AI. And finally, but not least, our community of people in data science, developer, researcher, all the technical community need also explainable AI in order to provide new access of research, new way to explain the, the, the prediction of a model. An explanation can have, can take different shapes, different forms. It can be text explanation, it can be visual explanation. There are many ways to provide an explanation. The main question is to ask uh, what is the best way to target and to uh, fulfill the requirements that I have to do. Uh, explanation by example, we can cite also explanation by simplification, feature relevance explanation, and local explanation. So as you may see, there are many uh, ways to provide an information in an intelligible way, and we can of course ally many, uh, many forms together in order to provide an explanation. So I've been giving you a lot of definition about what is explainable AI, how um, how uh, how can we who who will have who what is the target audience sorry of explainable ie and what is the explanation form but let's go into some concrete examples so first there is a wrong idea that explainable ie is just related to machine learning no explainable ie can be uh, it is a matter that is related to different things it can be machine learning robotics game theory it can be multi-agent computer. All the fields of artificial intelligence can be, um, can be related to explainable AI. What kind of question can we ask when you use explainable AI in those different fields? It can be, for example, for multi-agent system, which agent strategy, what is the, the strategy of my agent? For computer vision, we can be wondering about what is the complex feature that are responsible for the classification and for knowledge presentation and reasoning, it can be about the axiom that are responsible for inference. The main idea here is to tell you that when you use IA, at some point, 
nowadays, we are no longer interested in just having good performances and having um, good predictions. We also want to understand why, and this is a matter that, that is related to all the AA fields. Um, we can also say that explainability is not just a scientific question. It's also, it can be also a business opportunity. I discovered recently, and I think it's quite um, a funny story to share with you, that uh, Spotify is using explainability in order to, um, to optimize the relation with their customers. So they are using explainability in order to be able to explain to their customers why do they recommend such music or trust playlists. And the main idea is that the customer will understand and will be happy to have the explanation so he will stay um, longer in the platform of Spotify. And it's a great thing to discover that there is a company that uses explainable AA in a, such a way, but on top of that, that contributes to the scientific community through publication, scientific publication, and the scientific workshop. And um, by the way, I do not work at Spotify. I do not know anyone working there, but I thought it was a funny story to share with you today. Well, let's go a little deeper in technical side. So when you want to do explainable AI, there is different way to do it. First, we can cite some frameworks. There is indeed nowadays many frameworks available. This is a non-exhaustive list, of course. There are open source framework like the XI framework and the, like the AA explainable framework. The first one is uh, the code is available on GitHub and it is made by the Institute of Ethical AA and Machine Learning. The second one is provided by uh, IBM and they were one of the first companies that launched um, a framework about explainability with the promise that they can treat everything. And we can also cite Captum, which is quite recent, I think, from what I heard, which is a modern interpretability for PyTorch, the framework of Facebook for doing a scientific uh, uh, Python, I mean, doing um, a framework for Python in, um, in the scientific field. And uh, there are also uh, Google Cloud services in order, um, in order to make AI. So, there is indeed many tools that you can use in order to try to mine your model, the data and the behavior. But there are also another approach. We can implement and choose uh, to implement some specific uh, algorithm. When we want to do, to make explainability, the first question that arises is what do we want to explain? Do we want to explain, for example, the data? Do we want to explain a particular prediction or global behavior of um, of a model, or do we want to, to, to look at the model itself and its mechanism and uh, to, to explain how does it deal with the data? Well, there are many techniques, approaches, like the ant hoc approach here and the post hoc approach. Well, the first approach is uh, related to transparent model. These models are interpretable by design. It means that by the architecture and the way they work, they explicit by themselves the internal mechanism and by extension the, online, the underlying uh, reason of the behavior. The ant hoc approach here consists in optimizing the, trans the transparency of a model. For non-transparent model, it is usually a post hoc approach that is preferred. This type of approach, approach will consist in developing a directly uh, in developing or applying directly a technique in order to explain a model that, or, that is already trained. The, the post hoc approaches are really uh, used, are, most, are the most used and um, widespread today because they are the one that allows to explain the deep neural network in deep learning. And uh, indeed, indeed, when we start uh, looking at the explainability of this model, we say that we can use two approaches one that is agnostic, the other that is specific. In the, when we work on explainability and we choose to do model agnostic approach, the main idea is that we will develop an algorithm that will explain any machine learning model. The most famous model here is the framework line, which, is, uh, which allows to study the impact of parameter of the, on the behavior of model. And in the second case, when you choose to do the model specific approach, it is well important to note that 
it is it will it may be the model the architecture the parameters the computational complexity the learned data everything can be mined to explain the behavior can be studied and this brings a lot of complexity because each neural network or each family is thus analyzed deconstruct to become explainable and thus most transparent this is a quick view about explainable techniques for deep neural network as always, there are many ways to, to, to look at the problem. Do we want to explain, for example, the processing of the data by the network? Do we want to explain the representation of the data inside the network? In which case, it would be nice to see maybe the role of layer, the role of individual units, or maybe we want to create explanation producing system. And uh, in which case, the attention network model uh, can be great to deal with. So the main idea here is to give you just a hint about all the possible things that are pos the majority of possible things that we can do in, in explainable IA. One last thing that we didn't uh, discuss yet is the cost of implementing explainability. Well, it, uh, there is a human cost first, because when you do explainable IA, you need an expert that knows the model, knows the data. And this is not easy to find something, sometimes. It's also important to know that there is a computational cost since um, we need to launch many simulations before to choose the right uh, explainable technique. There is also a temporal cost in order to find, the, to implement, to test the framework, or evaluate and assess the explanations, the provided one. And finally, depending on the context, of course, there is a financial and legal cost. So it's not easy to just launch and do explainable IA. In the industry, or more general, um, let's agree that, for example, in this specific context, it is if the the more the critical is a mission and the associated technological factor important, the more important the explainable techniques are. It is especially true if the human being, its trust and its acceptability at, are at the heart of the business process, at the scientific uh, or the scientific question. So this is really important to, to, to keep in mind because we need to understand the algorithm and the model, the behavior, just in order to be able to interact with them. So the explainable IA field is really exciting, but also very vast, as we just saw. And in the question of human machine collaboration, it has a lot of challenges ahead of it. So let's see some of them. Well. At the research and technical level, we can um, we can first let me tell you first that there is no consensus in explainable AA. This field is still emerging, so there are many things that are ongoing and will still come. When which is exciting because it means that we, there are still a lot of work to do in this field. Um, a technical challenge actually is uh, for the moment is how do we prevent biased AA through the study of cognitive social bias algorithmic bias how do we can we can we fight against discrimination due to these models and one of the solutions that start uh, being studied is the explainability for a hybrid approach at the cross of the symbolic ia and deep learning in order to inject some pre preliminary rules in the models so here these are just some ideas from the literature and then there are also ethical and social uh, challenges. First of all, since there is a big crisis between human and machine about the trust and um, acceptability, so it will take time to, to, to get uh, the explainable IA field adopted and acceptable by everyone in order to reassure people that the explanation are really, um, the explanation, they can trust the explanations provided. And one last point, but not least, and which is really important for me, and I think some of the speakers will agree with me, is that humans are a determining factor in IA from conception to usability. So we need to keep them in the loop in all the diversity. For some more inclusive, transparent, and ethical AA, we need people from all over the world. We need women, men, we need really everyone. And this is really important to, to put it light. And to conclude, I will just give you a little, a little hints about 
how can we get into explainable IA field? Well, I don't know how can we get today, but at least I can share with you um, my feedback about this field and my journey about how did I get into it. So I have a computer science background and I think it's important to say that we need to learn how to code and not just how to learn to use framework. Once we have the basic in computer science, we can almost learn everything in computer science and that's really important. I'm a woman really interested in understanding the human being, understanding the human brain. That's why I end up working in cognitive science. And cognitive science is the field that is interested in the cognition of humans. How do we plan? How do we learn? How do we behave? And that's important because it's quite a big inspiration for me when I have to design new algorithm, AI algorithm. And this, all this element led me to work in a field where I was wondering how can I extract knowledge from recurrent neural network using LSTM? So how this is this was my first um, my first adventure in uh, interpretability of neural network. And today I have the big pleasure to work as a postdoc researcher in the field of explainable IA and how to deal with time series. So I don't know if it's something I believe today everyone can go into the the explainable field because the context today is not the context nine years or nine years ago when I wanted to do uh, IA. So there are many ways people from cognitive science can go to explainable IA and the computer science can go directly to, comp to explainable IA without going through all the, the process as I did. I mean, all the different steps. I can share more with you, but I think that it's more important and interesting for you to, that I share some advices that I got from different people that I used to work with, like my PhD supervisor, my postdoc supervisor, and I think it's important to, to, to share them with you. So for the first one that I received was give your best in order to be the best and to live with no regrets. It's really important. It's not the idea to compare ourselves to people at Facebook or Google or people all over the world, but just to know that at the local Perimeter where we are, we, can, we did we did our best. Let's agree that failures in life are inevitable. So that's sad, but it's true. So we need to learn from them and to process them in order to improve to a new version of ourselves. Let's agree that we need to detect and run away. I mean, it's usually life experience that teaches us how to detect, to, to detect, sorry, and run away from toxic environment and people because it's energy consuming, time consuming, and all the energy and time that we put in dealing with this kind of environment are time that we do not use for ourselves. And that's really sad and fortunate. And one of the most concrete advice that I got during my life, even as an engineer in computer science was, don't forget to coach yourself as your own project. Invest on yourself, like uh, what are your short-term, mid-term, long-term goal, take training and personal development course, why not? And use technique to optimize your work. And finally, in order to not take a lot of time, the context actually, we work data science and machine learning and AA is an international context that brings international opportunity. So feel free and legitimate to contact people, to reach them for virtual collaboration and advice is the best way to learn from a lot of people at the same time and to just to get to know more people. And it's important in our field. And one that is maybe more philosophical, that life is a journey with bad and good moments, and we need to live each one of us um, fully, if it's possible. So thank you for your attention, and I hope that this presentation was interesting for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ikram, for your presentation. It was awesome, and we learned from, so much from you. And thank you for all advice that you give us as a beginner and as uh, we just uh, start our experience in uh, as a phd so uh, we need uh, so much the, this kind of advice so uh, just i we uh, we have some question from the audience in the uh, youtube uh, streaming so uh, we we will take just one question because we don't have a lot of time to to continue so there is a question uh, they said that uh, it's it's known that the, the deep learning techniques are kind of heavy to implement in the term of uh, parameter tuning does adding the expl explainability will not add more uh, complexity that's a really interesting question and thank you for the person who asked it 
indeed there is more complexity when you when you want to do explainable AI applied to deep learning because first we'll have a first layer of a deep learning algorithm which is a complicated question to find the right parameter the right architecture uh, the right data and to look at the biases first and then you have the second step especially when you use post hoc interpretability explainability sorry and indeed there is more complexity but that's the reality that we live in. We are going to use more and more complex architecture. We are currently talking about cognitive architecture. And then we will need, the more, the more complex the architecture becomes, the more we will need explainable AI. I, this is my personal belief because we will not need to understand the parameter, but we will need to know how are we going to be impacted by the, the model. So yeah, it's a complicated question, but but we are brave and we will be able to deal with them. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for uh, your response. And uh, uh, for all our uh, attendees and audience, uh, don't uh, hesitate to reach out to uh, Ikram. Uh, it will welcome you if you have any question about uh, uh, her presentation or something uh, related. So thank you so, so much for your presentation. And now we will uh, pass to the next talk. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Nermi. Hello, everyone. Hi, Nermi. How are you? Thank Good. you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much. So, uh, so you can start your presentation now. Perfect. I yes. Will, I will. Yes. Uh, can you? Yes, so maybe I'll start by giving an introduction while yes. you give access to share my screen. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invite. I'm really happy to be with you today. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. Um, Nermin Lahmadi, I'm part of uh, the data and AI team at uh, Microsoft UAE. Uh, where basically I work with a lot of the customers in uh, retail and transportation uh, around how they can basically use AI and how can they leverage it to uh, better serve their customers and uh, to be able to have, for example, personalization uh, and, and give a better experience uh, for their customers. Prior to that, uh, I spent around a uh, couple of years in, in SAP, where I was leading the Customer Innovation Lab, um, also in the, in the field of data and AI, also working with customers around their digital transformation journey and how they can leverage the power of technology to really transform their businesses. Uh, I still don't have access, so I'm not sure if somebody is granted. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry, there is just a technical issue. I will fix it. Sorry. No worries, no worries. Okay, so for the sake of today, what I wanted to share with you, I wanted to share with you some of the use cases that we are seeing within different industries, and what's the power of uh, AI in real uh, sorry, to, sorry to, uh, to interrupt you, Nermin. Uh, just Ikram, you are you still the host of the of the Zoom? Because, uh, you can can you give me the Ikram if possible? Yes, sorry, sorry, I will quit. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, can you can sorry yes it's it's okay more and it's okay now you can start now we are sorry for that <laughs> Uh, 
We don't hear you. Yes, let me know when you can see my screen. Not yet. Ah, it's okay. It's loading. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, I'll skip that. What I wanted to share with you today is basically some of the inspiring uh, use cases that we are seeing today in, in AI. I would say a couple of years ago when we used to hear about AI, it was more in research, more in theory. But today, as we work in, in, in different fields and different industries, what we're seeing is that the adoption from businesses is growing at a tremendous rate. Uh, having AI is no longer um, a nice to have, but it's more of a must have. Uh, and uh, we are seeing a lot of adoption, a lot of uh, organizations creating the data science team to be able to better serve their customers. So first I'll start with some of the use cases we are seeing in healthcare and how AI is really uh, helping healthcare and uh, moving us uh, more from proactive medicine towards preventative medicine and really changing the field of healthcare. So one of the use cases that I would like to share with you, it's called intelligent retinal imaging system. So for people that suffer from diabetes, what they usually have to do is that they have to visit hospitals every single year to be able to have their retina scanned and analyzed to be able to know if they are at the risk of losing their eyesight. However, we see most of the people uh, globally do not do that visit to the hospitals. One, because uh, of the expensive uh, test exams. The second thing is a lot of people live in rural areas and for them to have access to such a big machine uh, and be able to do that exam is not accessible to everyone. So what we have done is we've brought the uh, portable device, as you can see here, where basically by leveraging your cell phone, uh, you are able to scan the retina and using image processing, you are able to determine the anatomy of uh, that eyeball and be able to predict if a person is at the risk of losing their eyesight. Actually, if a person is pre-diagnosed that they are at a risk, this saves them, this uh, increases or, or actually decreases the amount of getting blindness by 95%. So just imagine how many people um, uh, or how many people actually were helping by just being able to detect that early on and be able to treat it and prevent it. Another use case that I would like to share with you is a use case also in hospitals, and it's around uh, the different equipments or the different machines that are usually connected uh, with the patient. So usually how these machines uh, work is that once something wrong happens, they, send, they, they put an alert to alert the staff, the nurses and the doctors that something wrong has happened. But what we've done is we've worked with uh, one of the hospitals to be able to do machine learning on real time feed from the vital signs from the patient and be able to move from uh, uh, basically waiting till the patient is sick to be able to predict that a patient uh, might be uh, might have something wrong, might have a heart failure, might have a kidney failure or so on and be able pro to proactively send that notification to the doctor so that the doctor can go visit the patient and be able to really provide that treatment uh, that would prevent uh, actually people from entering uh, the ICU or from having that failure in one of the organs and be able to really save their lives. So actually this has uh, uh, improved uh, the life saved and improved uh, getting people to the ICU way before something bad has happened and prevented them from having uh, issues, whether it's heart, kidney, or, or so on. To take it a step further, what we've done with a company, with a startup, is basically how you are able 
to move that remotely. So yes, we are able to do that within uh, hospitals, but basically how can you take that remotely and be able to measure the vital signs of a person while they are pursuing their day-to-day -day life? So one, the founder actually of this company called Cardio, Cardio Diagnostic, uh, Ziad Sankari, and which was also one of my professors, uh, actually founded a company based on uh, his personal experience where he actually lost his father at a very young age due to a, to a cardiac arrest. So what he wanted to do is to be able to connect patients that are at risk of cardiac arrests, arrests or cardiac failures with an ECG monitor that transmits data in real time with basically monitoring uh, the, the different ECGs, comparing that with historical data and comparing it with uh, how the ECG should look like and be able to detect anomalies early on to uh, alert the patient that he is at the risk of a heart failure or at a risk of cardiac arrest and be able to get the help that they are needed very fast alert the people, alert the doctor, and be able to prevent heart failures from happening in the first place. Another use case that I would like to share with you is dyslexia. Actually, dyslexia is one of the cases that is not diagnosed by um, neither a blood test nor a brain scan, uh, nor any medical test that can be conducted. So what usually happens is that uh, a doctor would have to ask, uh, monitor the patient for a very long time, ask his parents, ask the teacher, ask their friends to be able to detect that this a person is, has dyslexia. And this usually ranges from years up to even decades to be able to determine if a person has dyslexia or not. One of the areas that basically we've worked along with is one of the institutes where basically using a simple camera to monitor the eye movement of a child, you are able to see they will be reading a certain text and as they read that text, their eye movement would determine if a person has dyslexia or not just by measuring the patterns because, a pa because as you can see the person that has dyslexia read in a very different way than a, than a normal person. So uh, basically, and we're, we're able to reduce that diagnosis of dyslexia from years and decades up to less than a minute, where automatically you'll be able to diagnose a patient and be able to provide the right treatment for them. Even a more interesting uh, area that AI is playing an incredible role in is genomics. And this is also really moving or changing the way healthcare is done and most probably uh, changing the way we live our lives and the way we, we uh, go through illnesses and so on. So just to explain what's genomics in the first place, uh, basically, what happens is to be able to understand uh, the human gene, first thing that is done is sequencing through the DNA, which is done on a DNA sample taken from a person. Then what they do is they are able to understand the different variants within this DNA. But the third step, which is one of the most time intense steps, is being able to understand and annotate and know why something has happened. Why, why a, a certain person has this certain disease and how is the different gene sequence is affecting that. This usually used to be a very manual effort that took years and years uh, of very highly skilled people to be able to do. And now big data and AI is playing an incredible role in being able to understand and being able to interpret and uh, analyze and annotate why a, a difference in certain sequence of a gene will result in uh, basically a person having the likelihood of, for example, having heart failures or having a certain disease. So basically one of the uh, use cases- Every year, 
over here. Uh, that uh, basically it's used for as SIDS, sudden infant death. Uh, one of basically what they do is that they collect uh, the genes of uh, babies that, that die because of that very rare disease. And they try to understand the uh, relationship between the different genes and between that relationship to that disease and be able to start into a really new era of knowing that, for example, if we change that strain within that gene, how will that really affect human? And maybe one day be able to eliminate certain diseases by just changing a gene inside uh, basically our DNA. So this is really exciting. This is really revolutionizing the way medicine is, is done. And it's really a field that's growing uh, at a tremendous rate. To move to another industry where basically AI is playing a very big role, agriculture. One of the projects that we're working uh, uh, with as, as Microsoft, we have a program called AI for Good. You saw the retina scan. This is part of a program uh, that we have internally. But basically also how we're able to help and, and other fields such as how we are able to help farmers. So uh, in general, what we're doing is that we're collecting information um, about uh, the crops, about soil, about moisture, about temperature from the farm fields. This information is collected to a local farm computer where basically we are doing AI on the edge instead of doing, instead of moving all the data to the cloud, we are able to process uh, this information at the edge and only to transmit data when it is needed and when it is critical. Uh, basically, after AI is done on the edge to be able to better understand uh, the different data that we're collecting from these sensors, we are able to send uh, data through a low cost uh, connection to the cloud where basically additional algorithms are run and a heat map is done, uh, is created for the different fields with a recommendation on uh, how to best treat uh, the crops, uh, what, are, what is needed from the farmer and what needs to be done to be able to uh, really uh, improve uh, the, the quality of the crops and be able to have a, a better uh, outcome from the year to year. Uh, additional information is also captured, such as weather, such as uh, uh, location, uh, such as also satellite images that are also processed to be able to understand and to be able to give a better recommendation for farmers so that they can have uh, a better crop results. The final area that I wanted to touch upon, and these, bear in mind, these are only touching the surface of some of the use cases uh, of AI, and definitely the, the, the uh, results are endless in all the fields and all the industries, but those are some of the ones that I thought are very interesting for, for me, and I hope they are also interesting for you to, to see and see how they are applied in real life. So one of the use cases that is done in uh, financial sector is basically identity theft. So we see a lot of uh, hackers trying to get the identity of uh, people um, um, to get their information in, in banking. And being able to get this information, they would be able to steal their money, uh, be able to have access over all their data and all their uh, money and, and be able to, 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 to do that theft. So one of the things that we have worked on is behavioral biometrics in the sense that every person uh, would deal with, would use their device in a very different way than another person. Uh, the eye to hand coordination from one person to the other is very different. Uh, being able to know how fast a person types, how what's their style, how do they open things, uh, and then be able to detect that there's a certain suspicious behavior that the person is doing, 
which might mean that this is not the person that, that really owns the account. And being able to, on the fly, uh, detect that suspicious behavior and send an additional verification to that person to say, ask them, for example, for um, a secret question where even if an, a, a thief has access to their password, but they wouldn't have all the information that they need about them, and thus the account is blocked and it is saved from identity theft. So one last thing that I would like to leave you with is uh, one of the quotes that uh, basically our president and executive vice president for AI and research at Microsoft says is that ultimately the question is not what computers do, it's actually what the computers should do. And uh, uh, it's, it was previously mentioned by Dr. Ikram, uh, every single one of us has the responsibility to really use AI for the better, be, be able to really also understand that uh, the more diversity, the more representation we have in the field of AI, the more women we have, the more uh, gender diversity, the more race diversity, the more people we have from different locations of the world, that would really ensure that we are uh, moving away from biases and we are really ensuring that AI is used for good uh, to improve our lives and really change the way uh, that we operate in our day-to-day -day life. So thanks a lot. I'll leave it open for questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nermin, for your uh, presentation. It was uh, very amazing. Uh, we uh, we really uh, know about uh, the power of AI from uh, different uh, in the different field. So I have a question. Uh, me, what is the the future of AI? What is the future of AI? So I would say. I would say the future of is, is endless. You would see a lot of people that are very optimistic about it, and you would see yeah. a lot of people that are very pessimistic about it. I would yeah. say in the hands of every single one of us to really determine how things go. What I would tell you is that big corporations are taking uh, AI ethics very seriously. Um, yeah. I know that every single big corporation has a program for uh, ethics in AI. And this is something that, uh, that is not lightly looked at. On the contrary, it is looked at at, at a very serious uh, manner because basically what we do today will affect the results uh, that are coming. OK, thank you. I don't know if, uh, if one of our speaker or uh, uh, participant has any question to Nermi. I have a question, uh, Nirmin. Uh, I think that, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation because you give us uh, an insight of the application of AI in different fields. Uh, my question is that uh, it, is, it is very helpful and very good to use uh, AI in e-health since it will improve it, et cetera. But do you face some problems to convince doctors to use uh, EA solution to treat their patients? Yes, this is a very interesting question. I would say uh, different industries have um, different adoption rate of, of AI. Um, I'll take it in, in two parts, your question. The first part is you would see uh, industries such as retail highly adopting uh, AI and really using it in every single interactions with their customers. Whereas if you see uh, an industry like healthcare, it is a bit different because this is really affecting the way that uh, it's affecting lives directly. And uh, I would say that trust is not at the level that uh, uh, doctors are fully confident to be able to use it 100%. So what I would say in, in, an, uh, in an area like healthcare, what we are seeing is the idea of assisted AI in the sense that AI does not take the decision itself, but it rather gives the recommendation for a doctor on 
uh, understanding uh, historical data, be able to predict, be able to give a recommendation. But at the end of the day, the doctor or the nurse are the one that are taking the ultimate decision uh, because it's very important that uh, we have no biases. We have, uh, the AI might take a wrong decision which could be fatal. So I would say we are at an, at an era of assisted AI in healthcare rather than fully dependent on, on AI. I okay, hope that's- Thank you. It doesn't replace the doctor, but it helps mm -hmm. them to, 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 to take the decisions. And I think that uh, explainability that uh, Madam Ikram explained will be helpful in this case. Definitely, yes, definitely, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, more question. Uh, uh, they ask about uh, how did you get the data for all these projects for the healthcare for the how did you get the the, the data to to achieve the, the projects? So I would say yeah. yes, I would say these are different collaborations globally that we've done with different institutions. Uh, how did we get the data? Every single uh, use case has different data sources uh, that we tap into to be able to, to get it. But I do agree that uh, in the area of AI and what we're seeing across different industries, one of the most important aspects is, is, is data and being able to have that clean data to start with be able to first identify what's the different data sources, be able to augment it with additional data sources to be able to have uh, more accurate results and, and better outcomes. So this is extremely important to get uh, um, better results. Bushra, I think you're on mute. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, I want uh, to thank you so much for your presentation and for uh, responding to all uh, those questions. Uh, we learned uh, so much from you today and uh, we thank you so much to jo for joining us today. So uh, I think now we can uh, pass to, the, to Maryam, Maryam Al Khashafi now. Uh, can you uh, make me host now, Nermin, please? Yes, sure. Yes. Uh, hi, Maryam, and I want to thank you for your for joining us today. Did you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we, we hear you. So welcome, Maryam, and uh, I will uh, give you the, the floor is yours now. Thank you. So I will share my... Can you see my screen? Yes. Hold on. So let's start. Okay. So uh, I would like to, to thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's such a, a huge pleasure to, uh, to be part of this amazing event by and, and for women. It's, uh, it's always nice to see, uh, to see women community active in data science, uh, a field that we usually think is just, uh, just for men. So uh, my talk for today is uh, entitled uh, Artificial Intelligence from, from Theory to, uh, to Practice. And uh, taking into consideration the fact that I'm the third, maybe the fourth speaker, uh, I will skip all the, the theory definition, the technical details. Uh, that have already been uh, well discussed by, by the ladies before me. Uh, so uh, it will be shorter and more uh, oriented to uh, daily life of, of uh, data, data scientists. Uh, so here I will, I will start by a quick definition of, of, uh, of AI. What does it mean? Uh, history, sub-discipline of AI. Uh, then in second time, we, uh, we will talk about uh, uh, technical parts, the practices, here I'm going to sh uh, share some, uh, some use case that I worked as a data scientist between Morocco and France. Uh, the chance for me to, uh, to expose some, uh, some real world projects of, uh, of data science. We're going to see uh, supervised machine learning keys, uh, reinforcement learning example, and uh, data visualization. And by the end, uh, as you recommend, I will, I will share with you my little story as a uh, as woman in, uh, in data science. 
So here we define artificial intelligence as a, as a sub-discipline of computer science that aims uh, simply to make the machine learn by itself. Uh, to, to better uh, understand this concept, we will be back to uh, the computer science in the, cl the classical way. So here we have uh, a developer usually who uh, makes code and asks the machine to execute uh, uh, the comments. Uh, so here the biggest issue or uh, let's, uh, let's say the limits is that uh, the machine was completely dependent of, uh, of the human. And that was the idea behind the AI the first time. The scientists want to know if, uh, if, there, is a, if there is a way to make machine intelligent and uh, completely independent of, of human interaction. And from here, the nomination artificial intelligence uh, begin. So uh, the name of, of AI uh, appeared for the first time in uh, 1956 in one of the most uh, famous math conference in England uh, by the mathematician uh, who, who, uh, who invented the, the famous machine, uh, machine de Turin, the machine of, of Turin. So uh, the device that uh, evaluates uh, the intelligence of, of computers for the next uh, 10 years, uh, thousands of academic research in this field appears, and uh, there was a huge number of organizations that have, uh, uh, let's say, funded uh, research in this, uh, in this field, and it was uh, definitely the, the trend. So the surprise was that the situation was not uh, maintained because uh, the scientific pro proposition, let's say the modest one, uh, was not able to, to solve a very basic equation. And uh, here everybody was kind of disappointed. And uh, here we start a new chapter called the winter of AI, a period when uh, the AI was reviewed, a lot of question mark about uh, credibility of, of this science. And there was a lot of philosophers, uh, scientists from, from other fields, economists, and many, uh, many more who, uh, who have not, uh, not believed uh, on it anymore. Uh, then all, all the finding has been, has been let's say, uh, uh, retrieved, and the, the community was moved to uh, the hardware. The case uh, remained the same until uh, 1997 with the famous Deep Blue uh, machine, the Microsoft product that has uh, uh, beat the, the, the chess champion in, uh, in a time. And the world, uh, we can say, reconciled with, with AI by, by a very simple application, uh, a game that uh, everybody knows. So and then, with the, thanks to the social media, internet, big data, and, and all this stuff, uh, the AI grew up until until being the, the first uh, the first trend today. Uh, here, for for understanding more uh, the, the the subfield of, of AI, I'm giving uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm inviting you to uh, imagine a kind of sphere uh, that we uh, we call AI, which uh, which bring together all the subdisciplines. At the first degree, we find uh, the machine learning, uh, a set of uh, mechanism and, and system that makes a uh, machine able to learn by, by itself, based on, on the statistics. Uh, still in the same area, we, uh, we find supervised and non-supervised machine learning. In supervised uh, machine learning, uh, the machine learning uh, uh, like uh, learn by uh, under the supervision uh, of, of the data scientists, uh, such as uh, classic modelization, for example. In the non-supervised machine learning, we have we have the case that uh, that we can estimate uh, the results, such as uh, ECP, for example. And then we have the deep learning, which keep the same concept of classical machine learning uh, plus the uh, neural network. So here we try to uh, kind of uh, mimic the the human uh, brain. Uh, well, to understand how much uh, AI is, is close to us, we, we can imagine a very classic day uh, in, in real life. We, uh, I think we all start our day by watching a music video in one of websites. This is an AI application called uh, Recommendation Systems. Uh, here we collect information about users thanks to uh, social media in, in order to propose a very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, customized content. I can see YouTube, Netflix, etc. We have also uh, the GPS application that, uh, that we, uh, we use almost every day. Uh, so here we are talking about uh, intelligence application, which collects in real time all uh, data about road, uh, traffic, to uh, propose you the, 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 the optimized results. We have also the emailing service, which is an application of AI called the, the, the text mining. We have uh, face recognition in our phones. 
which is a direct application of the computer vision. And the applications are many just to, uh, to show that, uh, that AI is around us and it's not uh, limited to a huge uh, technological company such as uh, Microsoft, for example. So uh, here I will show you some uh, of our works. Uh, I will start with classic machine learning application. Here I choose two uh, contributions. The first one is called a uh, new water quality uh, classifier in Cebu region. Uh, here the challenge was to, was to find uh, uh, a way to evaluate the, 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 the water quality in Morocco by classic machine learning. Uh, so here we start by uh, pre-processing data. We first collect data, uh, uh, deal with, the, with the, the, the famous missing data that every data scientist know, and, uh, and all, all the stuff of pre-processing data. Then uh, we, we devise uh, our data set into a training and data set, and we applied classical logistic regression to solve this uh, called NP uh, hard problem. So for the second pr uh, publication uh, in machine learning, uh, it's called Machine Learning uh, for uh, Cleaner Production in Casablanca. I will, I will share with you another, so it's on. Uh, can you see my, my screen correctly? Can you see my? Yes, we can see it, yeah. yes. Yes, so this is, uh, this is uh, our last publication called Machine Learning for uh, clean, clean Production in Port of Casablanca. So here, uh, the, the main idea, so here actually we have work on, on how to make production in Port of Casablanca more cleaner. Uh, so we, we switch, uh, I mean, from pull weight production to cleaner one. Uh, we contribute on uh, large saving energy with the, with the, with the gain of millions of dirhams per, per year uh, and very uh, important reduction of uh, CO2 uh, emission. So this work is actually in, in the process of studying for application by, by port staff. Here again, we applied the, the, the classical uh, machine learning, uh, starting with collecting data, real, real data from, uh, from, uh, from port staff, uh, pre-treating data, uh, uh, organizing data, and uh, uh, testing our uh, machine learning uh, models. So here we move to uh, another uh, subfield of data science called reinforcement learning. It's little, uh, I can say a little different to, to classic machine learning because uh, here we don't really need uh, uh, big data such as supervised or non-supervised machine learning. Uh, here the idea is learning by practice. It's well known in, in industry, especially in industry. Uh, so here we have what we called uh, an Asian in research space. Uh, he makes random step. And we accord uh, these steps to uh, rewards. We repeat these actions until uh, we got the best record of our model. Uh, here we work on, on PhD at uh, ENPT Engineer School in, in Morocco uh, in the field of uh, smart cards. Uh, we begin by, uh, by the implementation of, uh, of a classic reinforcement learning algorithm. Then we optimize it by, uh, by the, Q, uh, the Q function. Uh, QH from quality, and now uh, we're working on hybridization of this Q uh, reinforcement learning and uh, neural network, uh, which is called deep Q, uh, Q learning. Uh, the last use case will be the data visualization. Uh, here we, uh, we, we try to make uh, data more uh, significant and, and attractive. I will share with you. Uh, an example of interactive maps. So here we have uh, an interactive uh, map that you can surf and, and uh, choose one of African country. And then the data, the appropriate data of, of conflict, uh, 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 number of, of uh, uh, political issue will, will, will appear. So here we can, uh, as I say, we can, we can surf and click on African country and then uh, the, the data will appear. So uh, the goal of, of this kind of, uh, of, uh, of project, uh, which we call data visualization, is to help a decision maker to find the best solution to, uh, to this kind of uh, geopolitical issue in, 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 in our case. 
back to presentation. So here I choose your logo to uh, to share with you my little story uh, with with uh, with data. Uh, so I will I will start by by discovering the, the passion, which is the most interesting things uh, for me. It starts for the first time when I was uh, preparing my master's degree. I remember very well when uh, when my teacher charged me to to do some uh, some basic data analyst, not to, not data science, fully data science. So in, it was in context of, of water quality project in Morocco, and uh, and here I start, started working on it until we, we arrived in step where uh, where we had to uh, to wait for data engineers to do some uh, data stru structure for us to uh, to can explore ex explore the, these uh, these data. So I remember that those people take more than four months to to answer us, and uh, and here I did it myself. And when I show it to to my teacher, he was just uh, surprised, and he tell me, uh, you know what, you're gonna you're gonna take it, uh, you're gonna take all all the project. So this 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 was was the start. I work on it uh, with with too much fun, and uh, and uh, I remember that I was enjoying uh, all the time. I have came to uh, to the lab uh, at time, even even on weekends and holiday. Then I, I decided to, uh, to do my PhD in, in data science with the same uh, um, uh, teacher, with the same supervisor. And here, uh, my uh, small advice, if uh, I mean to, 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 uh, to all PhD candidates in data science or, or uh, other fields is to choose a human, a human supervisor, not only skills matter in this adventure. I think that it's very important to be uh, uh, surrounded by, by constructive people. So here in my PhD, I, I worked uh, on a heuristic algorithm. It's, it's kind of uh, algorithm uh, inspired by, by nature to optimize uh, an objective function. So we worked on many uh, real world applications such as uh, hydrology, mechanics, aviation, etc. In uh, 2018, I have defended my PhD and go to France on postdoctoral uh, position. And here I have the, I have got the, the chance to, uh, to work on green, green application of machine learning. Uh, the goal was to make uh, data center in France more uh, more green. Uh, here again, we use the classical process, starting with uh, pre-processing, uh, then that data treatment model testing until uh, uh, production of of uh, optimized uh, model. So uh, I think this this all. Uh, now I will give the floor to to other speakers. Thank you uh, for your time and for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Marianne, for your presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, I have one question for you. Uh, what is the challenge as a data scientist in industry or in academia? What is the, uh, the challenge that we, you, you, you may have? I can share with you uh, my experience in both uh, uh, Morocco and France. I can see it's more hard to be data scientist in Morocco than in France. It's it's uh, it's a sad uh, sad uh, truth. Uh, actually, we uh, we uh, we usually think that it's uh, being being a gig or or on Earth is is uh, is uh, just for men, and we we subestimate you when when you're a lady. Uh, I think that uh, you can see this in 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 your colleague eyes. This is. That was the first, uh, I think, the first uh, uh, we can we can call it challenge. Yeah. But uh, I think that that uh, if if you if you are uh, passionate about it, we can uh, we can we can prove that that uh, that women can be uh, the greatest data scientists ever. Voila. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, now we will have. Uh... Uh, a break for uh, 10 minutes and after that we will continue uh, with uh, Professor Kerima Shihab. Okay? Okay.
Can you please make me as a host of uh, the Zoom, please? Uh, Mariam, can you hear me? Hello? Can you make me uh, host uh, the host of the, the Zoom session, please? Okay, so, okay, alors, enregistré. Now choose one participant, which is uh, Bushra, please. Nommé animateur. Uh, for Bushra, n'est-ce pas? Nommé animateur. Oui. Changer d'autre. I think it's done. So, Bushra, can you please give me a hand to share my screen? Yes, yes, please. Uh, I did it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So I'll, I'll share my screen right now. I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Okay. So we will start. We will start in five minutes. Okay. Yes. yes. Great. Thank you.
Hello again. Hello, Professor Kim. Uh, before, before you start, I just want to welcome uh, Nargis because the, he, she just uh, attend us. Hi, Nargis, and welcome. Nargis, do you do you hear me? Yes, uh, I hear you. Just give me a few seconds because. Uh... <laughs> okay. No, I just want to welcome you because now the, is the presentation of uh, Professor Karima Shihadi. Hi. Hi, Nargis. Hi, Professor. Hi. Hi, Bushra. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your for accepting to join us today. It's my pleasure and it's an honor to hear all those amazing women presenting their tremendous work. Well thank done. you. Congratulations to all. Thank you so much for you. So, uh, Professor Karima, the floor is yours now. You can start your presentation. Thank you, Bushra, for inviting me to this special event. Uh, my name is Karima Shihabi. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Computer Science uh, at UM6P. And my talk today will be about uh, scalable data science and big data series. I'll dedicate the first half of the talk uh, about the research that I conduct and the second half about the personal story and how I got into this field and all the roadblocks and the lessons learned. Uh, so let's get started with the first part. So a little bit about my background. Before joining the university, uh, I actually uh, earned a bachelor's in software engineering from al Akhawani University uh, and a master's in computer science from the University of Toronto. Then I worked in industry for over a decade in North America, both in the Windows team at Microsoft, uh, Redmond in the US, and also the IBM Toronto lab in Canada. And um, after that, after working there for about, uh, you know, uh, almost a decade, I uh, decided to become an entrepreneur. I launched a company uh, in Canada, one in Morocco. And after working again, a number of years as an entrepreneur, I realized that, um, uh, you know, some of the problems that my customers were facing, my, my work was in data management consulting. And uh, so some, some of the, uh, you know, the, the problems that my customers were facing, um, I, I couldn't find, you know, the technologies that were offered uh, the right fit. Uh, some of uh, the, those technologies just didn't work well or didn't work at all uh, with large volumes of data. And so I started reading about the research uh, literature in the field and only then decided to go uh, into a PhD degree. So you can tell that my career was far from being linear and that's perfectly okay. Uh, so I earned a PhD in computer science from uh, Mohammed V University and Université de Paris. I worked specifically on the problem of scalable and accurate analytics over large volumes of high dimensional data. I worked with some great collaborators from Université de Paris, from Harvard University and INRIA. And currently, I dedicate my time to teaching, research, and also service. I'm honored to be uh, uh, acting as a PC member for uh, BLDB and ACM SIGMOD, which are the top conferences in data management. Uh, and I'm also honored to be this year's co-chair for NETIS, which is a regional conference on computer network systems. So uh, about my research, uh, I'm interested in solving this problem. How do we efficiently support scalable data analytics over massive high dimensional data. And this spans topics in database systems, distributed systems and machine learning. I'm interested in this topic because of the far reaching fundamental and practical impact that it has. In fact, high dimensional data is found in virtually every domain from finance to agriculture, medicine, biology, manufacturing, and all of the IoT data is high dimensional. Also from the application point of view, there are a number of applications that rely on scalable data analytics to leverage insights from the available data. And those include applications dealing with deep network embeddings, recommender systems, information retrieval systems, data integration pipeline, outlier detection, classification, and clustering. So to be able to get insights the of data that we have, we need to be able to support scalable data analysis tasks. 
And the high dimensional data that exists today is quite varied. There are many, many types of high dimensional data. One of the most popular types are data series. And what do we mean by data series? So a data series is a sequence of points ordered along some dimension. So when the dimension is time, it is known as a time series. And I think this is the most uh, known type of data series. This means that we take measurements over time and our data is ordered over, over time. So for example, IoT is an example, I ordered the sensor data that comes in an IoT environment is a time series. So it's a data series ordered over time. But the order can be different. It can be angle in astronomy, position in biology, or mass and frequency in medicine. So once we have this data, we need to uh, extract some knowledge out of it. And the existing algorithms just do not work well, either because they're too slow or because they're not accurate. So what, what are some of the examples of analytical tasks that we need to do or support on high dimensional data? An example is classification. So for instance, in predictive maintenance, the data that comes out of the sensors, we can build algorithms that detect some pattern in the data and thus be able to determine that a pattern is leading to a failure. And this can help us prevent the, the, detect the failure before it happens. And this is called predictive maintenance. Another example of analytical task is clustering. So clustering is um, grouping similar objects, similar data together. And one of the fields where it's extremely popular is in bioinformatics. I think Nirmi also mentioned, mentioned this application. So we, uh, bio, bio, you know, like I said, bio, biologists in general are interested in um, grouping genes according to their expression. And this helps them find um, cures for diseases or vaccines or a variety of other uh, you know, applications. Another uh, example of an analytical task is recommendation. And this also was mentioned by, by Nermin and Mariam in, in, their, in their presentations. So what do we mean by recommendation? So based on some information, we can tell users uh, uh, what they can buy or what they can use. So give them some advice. Uh, I think most of you have um, have, have had an experience with a recommender system, for example, when shopping on Amazon or when uh, uh, selecting a movie on Netflix or you know, in industrial setting, uh, recommenders are also popular. So for example, in agriculture, given uh, uh, some uh, characteristics about the soil, uh, we can recommend, we can build algorithms that recommend uh, the uh, right uh, crop to, uh, to plant in this soil or the right fertilizer for a given plant and soil. Another possible uh, analytical task that can be uh, carried out is outlier detection. So find me uh, the, uh, um, the object that is uh, really different from the other objects. And this is uh, heavily used in uh, cybersecurity. For example, in a network, you can detect, uh, build algorithms that detect that an intruder has entered the system. So what these algorithms or these application, analytical applications have in common is a subroutine called similarity search. So similarity search uh, consists of, uh, given some object, uh, similarity search finds the objects that are similar to this query object. And, the similarity depends, of course, on the domain, uh, but it's typically uh, expressed as a distance. And the objects are uh, represented with, uh, with a vector. Uh, the interesting aspect about similarity search is that not only it is required by these analytical applications, but also by what we call the data pre-processing pipeline. And I think every data scientist knows uh, that it's uh, one of the most time consuming uh, manually intensive and also expensive uh, tasks in the data science uh, pipeline. 
uh, I've heard, you know, one, I, uh, one of uh, the researchers I, I know, he, he said that um, data scientists are the world's highest paid janitors, unfortunately, because that, that, that data scientist typically spends 80% of her or, or his time doing uh, data cleaning, data integration, and other types of data processing. Uh, so it turns out that uh, similarity search can also be exploited in this pipeline, the pre-processing pipeline. So it is an extremely important algorithm. It has been studied uh, heavily in the past 25 years, and uh, there's a lot of body of work in this field. And uh, this problem is, uh, is very hard because uh, the data tends to be um, uh, you know, the dimensionality of the data is very high. It uh, can be in the hundreds or thousands, sometimes more, but typically that's what uh, we work with. And uh, the, um, what makes the problem harder, even harder, is the sheer volume of data that we are surrounded with. So currently uh, we deal with data that is in, at least in the billions. Um, so in uh, terms of uh, bytes, it's in the terabytes, but it is, not, uh, it is not uncommon to also have data sets that are in the petabytes. So designing analytical uh, applications that actually scale well uh, for this bit high dimensionality and also this uh, large volume of data is a critical problem. It's not a solved problem. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's attracting attention not only from industry, but also uh, from academia. So in researchers working both in industry and academic settings. So here are my contributions to, to this field. Uh, so I worked uh, with colleagues to demonstrate uh, that uh, it is possible to do efficient uh, high dimensional similarity search with theoretical guarantees. So there are two ways to solve similarity search. You can either uh, give exact solutions. So if you have an object and a data set with billions of objects, uh, suppose it's a, you know, it's a, uh, it's an image just for simplicity. So you can find within this large data set the image that looks like your query image. Uh, exactly looks like it, exact uh, match. That's the exact similarity, similarity search. But uh, because this, it's very hard to find the exact uh, match, uh, other algorithms were proposed to provide approximate solution. And uh, so we had in the research uh, community, uh, those working on exact solutions, but um, typically uh, working on very small data sets. And in the approximate uh, you know, world, there were two, um, two families, let's say, or two uh, trends. So uh, one trend focusing on approximate solutions that provide no guarantees in terms of the quality of the answers, uh, but uh, that are empirically um, efficient, and another trend that focuses on um, a similarity search or approximate similarity search with guarantees, uh, but uh, uh, without any uh, good empirical performance. And as you, you know, you know, in some applications, uh, quality guarantees may not be that you know, important, but in uh, fields like medicine or av aviation, and guarantees are extremely important. And we demonstrated that it is possible to have the best of both worlds. As you can imagine, uh, it, the ideas were not, uh, you know, adopted, <laughs> you know, easily. So we had to be persistent and conduct some really thorough experimental work to prove, to demonstrate that uh, our claim is actually um, valid. And we got our work accepted in BLDB uh, at uh, ICDE, EDBT, which are uh, you know the top conferences in data management, uh, we also went through voluntarily went through the process of uh, uh, reproducibility, and I encourage every researcher to do that because uh, uh, what what it means is you uh, give your work, your artifacts, your data sets, your code to some independent uh, community of researchers who reproduce your results. And by giving you this label of reproducibility, um, you get more credibility uh, and you can also have more impact. So there is a bit of additional work that you need to do, but it's certainly worthwhile. So another uh, key uh, contribution that, that we made is that 
so I imagine, uh, so remember that I said, you can have exact search, you can have approximate search. Um, so approximate search is a uh, similarity search is, um, you know, preferable because uh, in uh, disciplines where um, it's not critical to have guarantees. Um, now for exact search, how can we make it faster? Uh, so we propose some techniques to um, provide the progressive answers. So what does this mean? Uh, typically when an analyst is uh, uh, working on a data set, uh, they, you know, when she runs uh, her queries, these queries are what we call exploratory in nature, uh, which means that these queries are not final. Um, they are formulated, uh, then the analyst uh, sees some answers, and then she has to reformulate her query to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to adjust it, to tune it. Um, and this process is extremely long, especially that the query, each query takes a long time. It can take hours sometimes. So what we propose is that instead of making the analyst wait until she gets this final answer, which I, uh, could take uh, you know, hours, we uh, provide intermediate answers uh, that converge to the final solution. And we give guarantees on top of these answers. So for example, I can tell uh, my algorithm will tell the analyst, um, well, this is the uh, best match so far. And uh, if you want an exact match, then you might need to wait another 30 minutes. And then the analyst can decide whether she really wants to wait or not. Uh, we also give probabilistic guarantees. For instance, um, uh, how, um, um, what is the probability that the current intermediate answer is the correct one, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And this was also published in a top conference. Another contribution is Hercule is a similarity search algorithm that uh, he has state-of-the-art performance currently in terms of exact and approximate search uh, for in-memory data and on disk. Uh, we conducted uh, experiments on terabytes of data. Um, uh, my research uh, is highlighted in an issue uh, of the communications of the ACM. There is a special issue on the Arab world that uh, just came out, uh, I think it's a couple of days ago, and it has a highlight on, uh, on uh, my research results and also on UN6P. I invite you to read it. It's actually quite comprehensive. It gives a, a great uh, um, you know, view about uh, the computing research in the region from Morocco all the way to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, uh, covering different countries, uh, different disciplines. So I heavily invite you to, uh, to read it. So that was for the first part of the talk. Um, but the second part of the talk, I'd like to focus more on the personal decisions and um, the difficulties, uh, the lessons learned. So uh, why choose data science? Data science is a, is a very interesting field. Um, I myself get bored when uh, I work in, in a narrow area. So for me, it's important to work in an area that offers uh, uh, an intellectual challenge and where I can you know, choose uh, uh, different topics each time. So for me, the intellectual stimulus that data science, so I started out in data management. Uh, data science, you know, the term has been coined later on, and it's an umbrella that covers uh, data management, uh, AI, uh, cognitive science, uh, you know, many, many other uh, disciplines. So my focus is the data management. Uh, part of data science and also the machine learning. I think it's a, a great field because it's, a, it's intellectually stimulating, things are constantly changing, so I never get bored. The second, uh, I think, um, reason why anyone would want to go into data science is the job outlook. And as you know, uh, currently, especially with the, you know, what's going on with the COVID and the cri economic crisis, it is critical to pick a field that has a uh, great potential in the future and I cannot think of any other field uh, better than data science. Another um, aspect that I really like about data science is the possibility to work with experts from different fields. So I had a chance to work with um, neuroscientists, uh, and seismologists, and, uh, uh, and physicists. So if you are interested in psychology, you can work with uh, with psychologists on a, on a you know, data science, on a data-driven uh, problem in their discipline. If you're interested in agriculture, you can uh, work from a data science or a computer science uh, perspective. Uh, 
uh, with uh, farmers to help them improve their yield, it, really the, the opportunities are endless. And for me, I, it's a, a definitely a great, um, a great positive uh, asset for, for this discipline. Uh, and because you have this chance of working with so many different people from different fields, uh, you have a better chance uh, of uh, making, having a, a bigger impact. And uh, I think for me, it's important that, you know, because I work, then I might as well have an impact. Uh, you know, I don't want to be just uh, working on, on, on some project, meaningless project. It's important to work on a project, regardless of the discipline, uh, where you can impact the society where you live. Uh, so that's about data science. Now, uh, what, okay, so in data science, you can take different uh, tracks, right? You can become a data scientist, a data engineer, um, a data analyst, you can become a consultant, you can become an entrepreneur, you can become a, a researcher in industry, you can also become a professor. And uh, in my life, I, I, I wore different hats, uh, you know, I worked in different positions, uh, and I think there is no perfect uh, position or perfect, uh, uh, let's say, career option. Uh, your your taste might change depending on uh, where you are in your life and at what point uh, you are in your life or your geographic location, all kinds of aspects that can affect your decision. I like academia. That's why I went, you know, after all these years in industry, I went back to academia for the following reasons. So flexible hours. I think it's important to, uh, for me, actually, I worked at Microsoft, I worked at IBM, and I always had flexible hours. In every single position where I worked, it was a must. So I would never work a nine to five job because that's just not how I function. Uh, I, uh, you know, I have my best ideas when I walk or when I'm not sitting in the office. And so it was important for me to work in a setting that recognizes that what is important is not the number of hours that you clock in, but actually your contribution. So flexible hours uh, in academia, uh, I think it, it, yeah, it are guar um, mostly guaranteed depending on, on where you work. Uh, but uh, this is important for people in general, but it's mostly important for women and mothers because whether we, you know, we, we want it or not, uh, women are still bearing uh, most of the uh, care, uh, whether it's childcare or caring for relatives. And so once you have flexible hours, you can really work your life and work around you know, uh, all those demands. So for me, it's very important. The second uh, important aspect of uh, academia for me is autonomy. So I worked in an industrial setting and um, Unless you're an entrepreneur and you own your own company, uh, if you are in industry, you will be working, um, you know, to fulfill uh, the uh, a project that has been decided by someone else. Whereas in academia, especially if you work as a as a research in, in as a professor, uh, research professor, research um, in a research position, um, you pick your own projects. Of course, they have to be meaningful and you need to attract funding for those projects, but you really pick, you have a lot of autonomy in the, in the kind of work that you conduct. And this is, I think, awesome. Uh, the third aspect that I like about academia is the impact. So both at the technical level, because you can advance the state of the art in your field. And this, uh, you know, you, you publish papers and you, uh, the, those papers, if they are really um, meaningful and they are in top conferences and people read about your work, they can extend it. So you really contribute into the advancement of science. Uh, and uh, also industry can pick up on those ideas and implement them in products that millions of people can use. So the impact that you can have is, is just tremendous. Um, I also like to have impact on the personal level. I think many women are like that. And, and they, they like to see that they're, what they're doing has uh, impact directly on other people. And I think academia is great for that because you can work with your students and I get a lot of satisfaction working with my students and, and uh, seeing them grow and thrive. So that's uh, uh, the other aspect. Another one is international collaborations and you pick and choose who you want to work with. So that's great. Uh, and because of that, you uh, actually grow, you constantly grow. And the perk is you can travel 
all the time. That was before COVID. I hope that uh, it will pick up soon again. And those travels, I mean, you can take your family with you uh, and, uh, and they just work out, uh, you know, for me, it's an opportunity to, uh, you know, visit different places, different, uh, talk to people from different uh, horizons, different cultures. And uh, in academia, I feel that I can grow, um, you know, every day. Um, okay, so um, I will just um, conclude with uh, some of the main roadblocks and lessons learned. So for me, the main roadblock was that it took me a while to decide what I really wanted to work on because I was interested in so many things. I was interested in writing. I like to write poetry. I like to help people. So I even considered going into helping professions like psychology and so on. I also like to, um, to be creative. So I like to solve problems. And it took me a while to decide which career I wanted to pursue. I'm happy to, find, to have finally found it, which is in academia, because I can really do all of that. I can help my students. I can write because I write papers. I uh, work on problems, new problems. So this gives me an opportunity to express my creativity. But the advice that I want to give here is that you need to pick one field and become an expert in it. This is critical. You cannot get away by being, uh, you know, um, just um, a non-specialist these days. You need to specialize in a discipline. And of course, if you have other interests, you can either um, fulfill them in a hobby or try to incorporate them in your work. So the second uh, roadblock, I think, for many uh, women, particularly mothers, is balancing work and family. Uh, and there are different ways of doing that, and there is no perfect solution. Uh, so for me, what worked is... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the flexible hours are, are, are very useful uh, because when we say flexible, it does not mean uh, short hours. So hours can be really long, but at least I can balance my work. So my, my son, when he was young, I would, you know, I can be there with him, you know, uh, and then work in the evening or work early in the morning. So I was able to, uh, to work around, uh, you know, my family's schedule. And, and this is important. And everybody finds, you know, every woman needs to enlist a support system to help her. Uh, achieve this uh, this balance. Uh, the uh, another roadblock is that data. If data science is male dominated, data management is even more so. It's changing. <coughs> it's changing, but uh, you know, I I I I'm used to sitting in meetings where I was the only woman, and it can be intimidating in the beginning, especially if you're also a minority. So that was when I was back in the States or in Canada, it adds challenge over challenge. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. So just be strong. And uh, what I found is that eventually, if you are competent, uh, people will adopt you, they will listen to you. But it just takes, a, you know, time to establish your, um, uh, your um, uh, the trust, to establish that, you know, trust and that um, uh, credibility. But just uh, be sure that it happens. Uh, right now, when I go to conferences, especially in data management, people are extremely supportive, uh, men and women. So, um, but it takes time to get there. So just hang in there. Uh, it's also a very competitive field. So it's important to work very, very hard. Um, if you are used to be the first in your class, when you go to grad school, everybody was first in their class. So it's very competitive. And then those who go to PhD, the competition gets higher and higher. Uh, you know, as long as you uh, go up the hierarchy. So just prepared for, be prepared for that because it's important to handle the stress uh, uh, and you can handle it honestly by not taking things personal. So if something fails, uh, it's okay. Um, you know, uh, you can still pick up yourself and, and be a better, better person the day after. So some of the lessons learned quickly so I can leave uh, sometimes a question questions is uh, always trust your gut feelings, um, but be sure to differentiate intuition and fear because they can have the same physical <laughs> response sometimes. So it takes a while to understand, listen to your body. Uh, so I, I put it down a link uh, for, from a motivational speaker, Tony Robbins. I, I don't know if, you, if you've heard about him, but uh, he's certainly someone uh, very interested to know. And so just learn because fear also can block you and you don't want to listen to fear and never make a decision based on fear. Uh, but if your intuition tells you that you shouldn't take that job or you shouldn't go for that, uh, you know, work with that person or just listen to it, even if your brain uh, does not comprehend yet. I've never, whenever, I, you know, my intuition has never led me wrong. So that's one advice. The second advice is that the sky is the limit. So never let others impose their own limits on you. 
uh, it is okay to change your mind if you are in a career and you don't like it, as long as you have a good reason to do it. And as long as you move into a better situation, you don't want to be changing just to find the same problems or carry with you the same uh, problems. So, it, But it is okay to change your mind. You don't need to be stuck in a position uh, that you do not like. Success comes after many failures. This was hard for me to, to uh, because in our culture, if you fail, it's the end of the world, but uh, you cannot succeed unless you fail, as long as you pick yourself up each time. Uh, establish your own agenda, because if you don't have an agenda, an agenda meaning that you have goals for, that you strive to achieve, uh, be sure that you are fulfilling someone else's agenda. Uh, build a support system, extremely critical from friends, uh, family and also seek out mentors and uh, also give back. Uh, if you were mentored, it's important that you too uh, mentor students. You can go to a high school and speak to, to girls to encourage them into going into science or you can go into, you know, you pick your battle and you uh, just make sure you give back to society. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Karima, for your amazing uh, presentation. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all the advice that uh, we, we will learn so much from them. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, questions from the audience. We will check. And if there is anyone of uh, speakers or uh, organizer who have question, you can... I think Hasna have a question. Yes. Thank you, uh, yes. Karima, for your uh, great presentation. It was uh, really rich uh, in information, uh, personal and technical ones. Uh, 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 I have a question. Uh, and uh, since you get uh, the chance to work, and I think you answered the uh, kind of answer it during the presentation, is since you g get the chance to work uh, in industry and also in academia, uh, uh, if you can give uh, the people who want to change the path uh, some advices uh, to take to make the decision. I think it uh, it necessitates a, a lot of courage to to choose between industry or academia. Also, I, I have a second question. Uh, has not before your second question. So you said uh, I I missed one word. So you said you 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 want yes. to give advice to those who want to change from yeah, uh, academia is, or the other way. Uh, both, if both. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, the second question is, uh, uh, as researchers, we are always uh, aiming to write scientific paper. And you mentioned mm -hmm. that you like to to, to or the writing. But uh, can you please give us some advice to, to effectively write a, a data science scientific paper? Since I think it is one of the hardest things to do uh, once the, the experiment is finished. Yes. Thank yes. you. Oh, thank you, Hesna. These are excellent questions. Uh, so for your first uh, question, it takes courage. And that's why I said, uh, never make a decision out of fear. So because I, uh, I made changes from industry to, to academia, I mean, in somehow you, you take some steps behind. It looks like that, right? But it's not the case because you really move faster also. Uh, you know, when you make the, when you change, I, I was in North America and I moved to Morocco and that change also sets you back a little bit in terms of your career progression, but you, you gain in other aspects of your life, you know, being close to family. So any change that you make, just make sure that the reasons why you want to make that change are, are uh, logical and uh, have some... Uh, uh, you know, strong basis. Uh, so for instance, I wouldn't want to change from a job to another just because I don't, you know, my colleagues are not nice. Uh, that's not <laughs> because everywhere you go, there are good people and bad people. Uh, and I wouldn't want to change a company just because there is politics, because politics is everywhere. Uh, so you, you need to understand why you want to change. Okay. And so take the time to really think about it and also talk to other people. So you can have people, if you're working in a company, you can seek out advice from someone within the company that you can that you trust or someone outside because when, you, and not necessarily from family or friends because they can get emotional about those decisions yes. <laughs> and they may not help you. So uh, especially if you leave, you know, I left a, a lucrative career to go into a PhD and I thought that I would be able to do the PhD and also continue doing consulting. It's not the case. It was mm -hmm. not the case. So I had to stop consulting activities and focus on the PhD. 
uh, and that was right. a hard decision. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as you are doing something meaningful and you have this agenda, but I had an agenda, I knew what I wanted to be. And so when you have this goal that is uh, spelled out clearly, it's okay, you know, the, the difficulties that you go through, the obstacles, uh, you know, you, you overcome them and you become stronger each time. And when you get to closer to your goal, uh, you, it becomes easier and easier. So the, the short answer is not, not to listen to fear. Mm. So yes. just follow to reason <laughs> and intuition. <laughs> Thank you very much. For the second Thank question, I don't know if we have time, but uh, we can leave it yes. to the panel if yes. you want. I think yes, yes, you can, you can, you, okay. you can, you can ask yes. So for the second question, it's an extremely important question. I like to write, uh, but I never thought that scientific writing would be so hard. Um, so um, my best so advice. You just one or two, one minute, uh, uh, shorter, shorter. Short answer. Yes. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the best advice is to uh, train. So it's something that you uh, get good at uh, uh, when you train yourself. So every day, if you're a PhD student or a master's student, every day take one hour, half an hour to write, even if it's one sentence. And if you have a buddy, a writing buddy, or you two PhD students, you can work you know, together. One of you reads the writing of the other. And of course, you also get your work reviewed by someone who uh, that you respect, either your supervisor or or a more senior PhD student or a postdoc student. So okay. it takes practice. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for thank you opinion. so much, uh, Professor Kerima, for your uh, amazing thank presentation. You. And now uh, I will uh, I will welcome again uh, Nargis. Uh, can you, Professor Kerima, please uh, make uh, uh, Nargis as a host of uh, the Zoom? I think I made you push wrong. Uh, okay, I will. Okay. Uh, the floor is yours, Narjis. We are so excited to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure and uh, it's amazing to uh, hear and watch those uh, presentations uh, done already. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, before I start my presentation, very quickly, probably what I would like to say is that I spent 15 years uh, in the data world, you know, analyzing data, doing research, consumer insights to basically develop business strategies. And then when I wrote my book, uh, which is on women, women in the corporate world, um, I realized that a lot of the initiatives that we're doing today are probably not relevant for the future that is coming. And I started getting interested into AI and the fourth industrial technology revolution, technologic revolution, and the impact that it has on humans, but most, most specifically on women and the, the gender related um, initiatives. So that's how basically my, um, you know, my passion to AI uh, started and I have both, you know, like academic, but also um, industry uh, background. So what I would like to talk to you about today is the gender gap in the STEM fields. And I know Bushra has, uh, professor, professor, sorry, uh, Karima has uh, discussed uh, a lot of uh, uh, on this topic. And um, the first element that I would like to talk about if we think about um, the intelligent personal assistant, we have Siri, we have Alexa, we have Cortana, and by default, they have a female voice. But why? Probably because it's easier to develop a female voice assistant rather than a male one. Actually, no. On the contrary, it's more difficult to develop a female voice than a male uh, voice because they're actually higher, they're more variable, and it's more complex basically to manage. 
So then you're going to ask me, then why do we have, you know, most of the intelligent personal assistants uh, having female voices? Um, interestingly, if the intelligent personal assistant needs to provide a service, needs to listen to the customers, then most of the time it's going to be a feminine voice. But then if it has to provide an advice, more related to money, to real estate, to banking, etc. It's most probably a male voice. So there was an interesting study done by Clifford Ness, who was a professor in Stanford. And what uh, this study proved is that people, they do react differently to a voice depending on the gender. So usually masculine voices, they tend to inspire more respect and expertise, while female voices are not that well accepted when they come with authority, but they're more pos positively accepted when they are compassionate, sociable, and empathetic. So the answer is actually that it's related to the user's needs and expectations. So that's what people expect. So yes, definitely, there is a gender bias. And in the STEM uh, field. Uh, what are the facts, actually? According to uh, the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, less than 30% of the world's researchers are women. We've seen in the last decade more women, you know, female students, female graduates in the STEM fields. It's been growing, but they still remain a minority, and all of you has men have mentioned it. The gender gap is actually significantly higher in the fast growing and highest paid uh, jobs of the STEM. And why is that? First element is the social beliefs that are actually limiting beliefs. You know, the girl interest in the STEM fields, they are shaped by the environment that surround them, that, by the environment that they grow in. And the stereotypes, usually, they can lower the girls' aspirations into those fields. The other thing is the bias. And I'm going to talk a little more deeper on that specific point. But really, in general, we tend to associate men with the STEM fields, while women are more associated to artistic or different types of fields. So yes. They are biased and they are social beliefs that are limiting, you know, having more women into the STEM fields. So let's have a look at really why is this happening? So yes, the stereotypes do exist, but we have to walk through them. This is extremely important. And what I would like to do here is to look at two elements. First, the human bias, and then the second one, which is more the machine related bias. When it comes to human bias, I'd like to introduce the uh, concept of unconscious bias. Maybe uh, a lot of you have been exposed to this concept, but in order to understand it further, I'd like to share some data with you. 11 million. It's actually the bits per second that the human body sends to the brain for processing through all the senses of the body. But out of those 11 million, how many are consciously processed by the brain? Only 50 out of the 11 million. Second bit of data that I would like to share with you, 35,000. 35,000 is actually the number of daily decisions made by an adult. So an adult will make 35,000, roughly 35,000 decisions daily. It can be what are we going to eat today or which, you know, um, like path I'm going to take to go to work. It's all the decisions we roughly make 35,000 daily. 0 0.1 second is actually the time needed to judge someone. And we usually call that basically the first impression. And Normally, during this first impression, this is where our gut feeling tells us, you know, if somebody is trustworthy or not. So it's the first basically feeling that we have towards people that definitely impacts on the way we judge people. And then we know that a lot of the decisions we make 
are 90% unconscious and 10% are conscious. And what does that mean? All those data I've just shared with you. It's actually the reason why we call them unconscious bias. So most of the decisions we make are unconscious and they are shaped by our education, by our background, by what we've been exposed to, our environment, the media. And this is definitely what makes it unconscious. So there are so many decisions that we make that just are automatically made so that they're not consciously processed by our mind, but the thing by our brain, the thing is that it's absolutely normal and it's okay because everybody is biased. But the most important thing here is that we need to be aware of it so that when we need to make decisions that are incorporating people that are incorporating women, you know, and that are gender related, we try to make them consciously and not unconsciously so that we don't nurture the stereotype and the biases that we might have. Another big element why we have uh, unconscious bias is the media representation. I'll share with you a few figures. Did you know that when we look at TV commercials, most of the time women are more portraying the commercials that are related to beauty, to toiletries, to cooking, while men are more portraying commercials related to the banking fields, real estate, and cars. Did you know that Based on a study done by Unilever, where they analyzed tons of TV commercials and TV advertisements, they've done that a few years ago. What they've realized is that the number of TV commercials that were portraying female having a sense of humor was only 1%. Female as being intelligent, only 2%. And female, being leaders, only 3%. So that's pretty striking as numbers. So what do we see is that the media is definitely shaping the way we see the world, but also is definitely nurturing the, the biases, the human biases that we have. But on the other side, we also have what we call the algorithm biases. Um, the thing is that algorithm, and here I'm really like making it extremely simple. It's about data that you input and the output that you get. Basically, if the data that you input is biased, automatically the output that you're going to get is going to be also biased unless you work on it. And the other thing as well is that the majority of the people that are working on the algorithms are male. So when it comes to gender bias in the algorithms, it definitely needs to be worked at the source. So what can we do basically to fix the biases, to basically work on the gender gap that we have today in STEM? It's pluridimensional. No, there are a lot of elements that we can work on. And the first one that is extremely important is role models. If she can see it, she can be it. Basically, it's very important to have role models in those fields. It's extremely important to celebrate and to give visibility to those women that are in the STEM fields because it enables the young girls to project themselves and say, yes, I can make it too if I want. So that's extremely important to give them visibility to those women so that they become role models, you know, for the coming generations. The other element is about engagement. So when it comes to um, young girls, okay, and young women, it's very important to stimulate their interest into the STEM fields, but really at an early process, at an early stage of the process, you know, in the primary and in the secondary education, in order to stimulate their interest into those uh, fields. 
But on the other hand, it's extremely important to make sure that we recruit women into those fields. We see that there is not the fair share between the percentage of women studying in the STEM fields versus the percentage of women working in those fields. And basically, we don't have the fair share because we don't have, we don't recruit enough women in those fields. And it is important to work on the positive discrimination when it comes to more women into those fields. And it also helps to build, you know, those role models as well. So it's kind of a, um, a virtuous circle, circle uh, so that it enables also those young girls to see those women into those uh, very important positions in STEM. Another element is retention. And the Professor Karima mentioned it as well. The, once you get those women working into those fields, how can we make sure that they stay, that we retain them? It's about offering good support and work-life balance. This is absolutely essential, especially in some phases of their lives, like maternity, where they need to have this support system so that they are enabled to keep on, you know, thriving in their work. The other element is to make sure that we provide equal chances and equal opportunities for women, be it in terms of salary, but also in terms of promotion, so that they have the same chances to be promoted than men. So that's it for what we can do. But I'd like to finish on an important topic which is related you know, to the pandemic and what's been happening recently. Women has been, have been um, playing a central role during the pandemic. They've been at the forefront of the healthcare, but they've also been leading research when it comes to the virus, but also the vaccines. However, the pandemic coupled with the economic crisis, it has affected women even more. And what we've seen even in some countries is that the gender equality policies and initiatives, they sometimes been deprioritized from the government agendas. According to the Global Gap Report 2020, it will take another hundred years uh, to achieve gender equality in the workplace. And the crisis actually had a, a huge impact, even more on women. So what we have to do is to make sure that we double our efforts to reach our objective of gender equality. Thank you very much. That was my presentation and I'm here for any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Narcissus, for your uh, presentation. It was uh, very uh, insightful. So uh, I have one question for you. Yeah. Uh, I see some talks for you uh, in YouTube and uh, always when we talk about AI and gender. So uh, what is your vision for the AI in the future? Uh, this is the question. So... I think that if we keep on going at the rate uh, that we're going today and we don't change or we don't adapt basically the initiatives to the future, we might not reach our objective when it comes to uh, gender equality in general. Why? Because the, the technologies are moving extremely fast and they're reshaping the world as we know it. And a lot of the initiatives that are happening when it comes to gender equality. They have been thought on the world that we know, but not the tomorrow. But the effects of those initiatives are only happening in the future. So it is extremely important to inject those elements and those factors of what, how, the, how basically all those new technologies are impacting you know, today's world so that we make those initiatives much more basically effective. 
the thing is that we usually tend to underestimate the impact of the, the new technologies. Why? Because their progression and their evolution is exponential, while the human mindsets and the human brain is more used to kind of a linear uh, progression. So at the beginning, you know, uh, when it comes to like new technologies and their evolution, it's more of a flatter curve, you know, that goes steep, but very fast, but much you know, the, the steepness comes at a later stage. And the thing is that at the beginning, we probably overestimate its impact on the short term, but we underestimate its impact on the longer run. And this is absolutely crucial to take all those factors in place, in, uh, in consideration, sorry, uh, when thinking about initiatives that are gender related in, uh, in the STEM or in any field. Okay, thank you so much for your response. I have another question, if possible. Yes. Uh, uh, I want to know that uh, why do so many women uh, leave their careers in STEAM and uh, go back to academia or go back to another field? I think that uh, Professor Karima has mentioned it. Um, it's about flexibility, it's about work-life balance. The thing is that they usually don't leave at the beginning of their career, but it's, the leave is more related or the change is more related to the phases in their lives. And one of the key phases that's happening is um, maternity. When this happens, unless you have a good support system that enables you to keep on working as you do, you're not going to be able to do it. So that's why um, a lot of women, and we see that in any field, in STEM, but also in the other um, fields, we see a lot of women kind of stepping back and sacrificing their career or looking for more flexible type of jobs so that they are able to manage all you know like their personal life their kids and also their professional life the thing that we've seen unfortunately with covid is that even though it could you know from the surface show that it enabled more flexibility by working from home it actually burdened much more women then it helped them. Why? Because they women are usually have been during the pandemic taking over much more of the household course and also the childcare. And uh, so it has been very difficult for them to manage all this. So it led for a lot of them to burnout and to exhaustion. So it's definitely um, very important to build this kind of support system to enable women to uh, have a work-life balance so that they are they can thrive in their jobs okay thank you so much i uh, i got it uh, so now uh, we will uh, pass to the panel uh, talk uh, we will share uh, the, between all the, the speakers Uh, can you please, uh, Narjis, give me the host for the yeah. Zoom? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's still, uh, there is an issue. Can you please uh, now just uh, make me the host for the for the Zoom, <laughs> please? Um, I stopped projecting, but I don't know how to make you the host. Just more, and after.